Welcome back. We are talking infertility in our health and science focus this morning. And we are chatting to Dr. Antonio Rodriguez. He's from the MedFem Fertility Clinic. And uh, Doc, welcome back. We were just talking about the causes, if you're able to pinpoint the, the various causes of infertility in both men and women. And we're talking about, you know, just things we've heard growing up, things like mumps could make a man sterile, uh, you know, cycling shorts, the lifestyle habits. So, so they're the common causes that, that you've seen in, in your time. Yes, yeah, so on the male side, there are certain infections, and you mentioned the one that's the common one, but mumps happening once uh, the male has gone through puberty, that can affect the sperm. Uh, we don't see it. It's not, these are not big incidences. Um, uh, you know, obviously, once you know that a male's got a, a problem, we, we tend to suggest certain things like, um, you know, hot uh, saunas and, and those sort of things. We do uh, advise that. I think the principle of it at the moment is that in the male, uh, it's very important to, to assess them properly. So we look at all their hormones. Um, lifestyle plays a big role in males and females. So carbohydrate, excess in diets, high insulin levels, both in females and males, um, uh, and increased BMI levels. It doesn't always have to be BMI. You do have some normal weighted people who actually still have problems with insulin, both men and female. We've done a lot of work on the male side and published internationally on men that they also need to get their lifestyles right, eat properly, mm. reduce their carbohydrates in their diet, balanced eating plan if they have a, a serious insulin problem. And I'm not talking diabetes. That's uh, I'm talking about pre-diabetic type problems with high insulin levels. They, we advise them to go on a low glycemic diet, that means that uh, you be eating uh, carbohydrates that don't uh, influence sugars that much. It's very important to, to control lifestyle. We, we are a little bit lifestyle obsessive at Medfem, mm. and I think it does pay off. Stress, as, as I've mentioned in, in previous talks, plays a big role. Uh, it, it definitely affects the immune system. Our patients have a higher risk of immunological problems and autoimmune problems. They have a very high incidence of endometriosis. These are all, in our opinion, stress-related. They are precipitated by problems with the immune system. So, yeah, I think the bottom line is, uh, you know, eat healthy, uh, do some exercise, cut out the smoking, cut out the drinking. If you do recreational drugs, they can affect your uh, um, s sperm mm. and, and definitely sperm and possibly eggs. So those things need to be dealt with as the individual. You can take control of your fertility. Mm. And if you're a young couple, take control from the beginning yeah. before you even try, you know. Well, Doc, let's talk about the alternatives when it comes to solutions and treatments. What do you offer? Okay, so, you know, the, as you said earlier, the most important principle make the diagnosis define exactly what's wrong with this couple is it dual factors where is it and depending on that spectrum it might be as simple as correcting a thyroid level it could be as simple as a little cheap thyroid tablet that gets the pregnancy and we can see that when we're managing the patient so we look at and, and again it's a philosophy we have we will look trying to get people pregnant naturally if we can sometimes you have to go straight to in vitro fertilization because there's such a mm. severe male factor or because the female might be um, running out of eggs and you don't have time to, to do other things. Laparoscopy in the female plays a big role. Um, we, we, we look with a camera in, into the abdomen and we look for uh, um, endometriosis mm. and we manage it uh, surgically. Those things are all important, and it does depend on the patient. Yeah. So we can go from simple timing of ovulation, getting little things right, right up to assisted reproduction where we're doing in vitro fertilization, mm. injection of sperm into the egg if we have to, pre-genetic testing where we can check the chromosomes in that embryo if, it, if it's indicated. So that spectrum is, is offered. And... You know, the clinics in South Africa are world class. Mm -hmm. uh, they all work, all the top clinics are world class, I must say, and uh, proud to be South African yeah. with all of them, you know. Well, Doc, at what point would you say to a couple, I'm sorry, we've tried everything, there is no possibility, you won't be able to have children of your own. I mean, is there, a, is there an age cutoff? Is there a number of uh, uh, in, in vitro cutoff? You know, you've reached, you've, you're only allowed to do so many, you can only be so old. What's the, what's the deadline, if I were to put it crudely? Correct. So, so the cutoff, obviously, 
the, the, the real cutoff can be that uh, a woman runs out of eggs or that the sperm is so severe that we're not getting good embryos. So that, that is a cutoff for that couple's genetics. But then we have the option of using donor eggs, donor sperm, combinations of donor eggs and donor sperm. So, and, and obviously if someone has a real problem with the uterus where we, we won't achieve a pregnancy, there's an option of surrogacy. Mm. So it's quite rare these days to say to a couple that you can't have a baby. Uh, you know, you, you, you have alternatives. Some people are not prepared to go down that alternative route of using uh, oocytes, uh, donated oocytes or sperm, donated sperm. But literally, we, and, and we can go up to the age of 50 in a female where you can use uh, um, donor eggs. They have to go through a proper investigation, assessment by a physician. But we, we do help women in that age group, you know. So uh, it's very rare that you can't get to that end point for a couple. And obviously, you've then got the option of referring them for adoption, which yeah. is important as part of our treatment yes. process. You know? All right. Thanks very much for that, Dr. Antonio Rodriguez. They're just uh, kicking off our discussion there on infertility and looking at the various aspects. Well, there's a whole host of people involved in, uh, in diagnosing and, and, and treating and helping a couple along. A reproductive endocrinologist is a medical practitioner who diagnoses the causes of infertility. They offer a number of treatments, which includes as well in vitro fertilization, hormone treatments and surgery as well. The experts, as we know, have been warning more and more that infertility is not just a woman or a man's problem. Both partners do contribute. Well, let's chat now to Dr. Zozo Nene, an endocrinologist who deals with this, reproductive endocrinologist from Steve Biko Academic Hospital. Dr. Nene, good morning. And thanks so much for your time. So, so let's uh, start first with where an endocrinologist fits into the entire diagnosis treatment process when it comes to helping a couple have a baby. All right, so um, good morning, first of all, uh, Vika, and thanks for the invitation. So um, infertility um, can affect a whole lost, uh, host of disorders um, where in a couple you have to investigate whether it is an anatomical um, distortion or abnormality or is an endocrinological uh, factor that is affecting the infertility. So the anatomical ones is what uh, Dr. Rodriguez has mentioned. It can be a variant factor, it can be tubal, uh, it can be in the uterus uh, and in the male, it can be problems of sperm transport, sperm production, and uh, the function of the sperm. So what we do then in the endocrinological section of it, we look at the hormones that are involved with infertility whether the ovary can produce the estrogen, or if it is not able to produce the estrogen, then we look higher up where the higher centers, like in the brain, mm -hmm. there's a follicle stimulating hormone that is supposed to, to um, sort of help the ovary to produce the estrogen and develop the follicle. So we look at the whole uh, cascade of effects of endocrinological factors. And as such, in the male as well, we look, when we investigate, at the whole cascade of hormones that are involved in fertility. Mm. So, Doc, I understand that there are two types of, of, of infertility. There's a primary and secondary. Just explain to us the difference, please. Okay, so as this, it was defined earlier that it's an inability to fall pregnant after a year of um, you know, having um, intercourse that is unprotected and that is regular. So the primary infertility is when someone has never had a pregnancy before. So that is just primary. So secondary is when there has been a pregnancy, whether it resulted in a miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy, um, but as long as or a live, a live baby, so now they are unable to have another child uh, because of um, infertility, so where there has been a previous pregnancy before. Okay, so just because you've had a child doesn't mean you can't struggle later on. And, and, and do, you see, do you see a lot of that, Doc, in, in your practice where somebody's successful having and then battle to have uh, kids afterwards? Yeah, we, we see it quite often, and secondary infertility actually is seen in sub-Saharan Africa as the commonest cause of infertility. 
And it can be a number of factors that cause that. Maybe someone has developed infections such as sexually transmitted infections that can block the tube, whereas the tube was open before, now it is blocked. And it can be ovarian factors, you know, that can um, affect that and, and cause secondary infertility. Some people develop at a later stage something called fibroids, which is mm. masses in the muscle of the uterus that can cause infertility as well. So there are quite a number of causes. And in the male as well, they may have infections and they may be, um, you know, uh, exposed to toxins that can affect sperm production or sperm function. And um, uh, lifestyle diseases, um, smoking, uh, excessive mm. alcohol, illicit drugs, and the men that now join the gym and uh, bodybuilders, they take steroids. Those mm. steroids are what affects uh, the sperm in later life. So it can be a host of causes. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk, um, you know, the, the various treatments. We heard from Dr. Rodriguez what it is they do at, uh, at his practice. Uh, when it comes to treatment, you as a reproductive endocrinologist, where, what is the first sort of course of action? Where, what's the plan when a couple comes to you with a problem? So I, I think it works together. It's not just we don't only focus on the reproductive part. So we look at the, the causes of infertility as a whole. So we investigate whether there's a tubal problem. We do something called the hysterosalpingogram, and we look at the, whether the tubes are open or not. That is where we start. And we look at the fact that are they ovulating or not? Because if they are not ovulating, then we look at the endocrinological reasons why they are not ovulating. That's, that's where it comes from. And then in the male, we look at the sperm. Um, the sperm count, as Dr. Rodriguez mm -hmm. says, sperm count, uh, sperm, whether it is moving or not, is the motility of the sperm. And we look at the morphology, which is the head, the neck, the tail of the sperm, then whether the sperm is normal or not. And if we find that there's any abnormality then, whether, whether it's in the count or the morphology, then we can suggest that um, we do more endocrinological tests. Mm -hmm. So there, it's not a, a basket of tests mm -hmm. that we do. It's, it, it's geared towards finding the cause because mm -hmm. the tests in themselves can be very expensive. Yeah. So uh, we have to do tests that we know will get us to the cause. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, yes, uh, that, that's the common story we hear, Doc, is that this is a, it's a very expensive business to try um, often to fix what, what the problem is and go through, especially if it's something like IVF. It, it, it is quite costly, but I suppose most couples, if they desperately want to have a baby of their own, will go, will go the, the, the whole hog with that. Are there alternative treatments? How popular and how safe are alternative treatments? Are there, we hear things like acupuncture, we hear you know, homeopathic, uh, maybe possible solutions as well. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you're able to maybe just uh, give us a little bit of insight into that. I think from the um, perspective of an academic, we always practice evidence-based medicine. So where there is evidence that there will be benefit from that um, uh, intervention, then we can recommend that kind of uh, uh, an intervention. So where the evidence is low or limited or where there is no evidence of benefit, then we cannot recommend that kind of um, treatment for the patients. So what we do is the investigations that we do are all evidence-based investigations. Like I said, we don't just do a battery test and hope that we, we, we will see a, a, a cause. Yeah. So they are always um, directive and they have to be cost effective and in, in the end they must benefit the patient there must be a treatment that we know that will uh, benefit the patient mm. so if we know that things like acupuncture i have no evidence mm. that acupuncture helps so i it is not something that i can recommend mm. so i can only recommend the evidence-based mm. treatments so tell us about the success stories uh, here, because like you, say, uh, like you said earlier, if you start and you check out your hormones, and, and a lot of the time it's just a simple uh, you know, idea of, of fixing something that's going wrong, for example, with your thyroid or whatever it is, 
the rate of success that you see in, uh, in your practice, Doc, when it comes to couples coming in early enough, looking out for the signs, and then doing what you're asking them to do? So um, success, especially with, pre with assisted reproductive technology, is, is about 30 to 40 percent. Mm. So that is worldwide. It's not just in South Africa because we have not, after all these years, not been able to improve it to more than that. However, there are instances where, for instance, a patient has a polycystic ovarian syndrome and they are not ovulating, and then we, con if we correct the abnormalities such as the high male hormone, mm. the testosterone levels or the androgens, and then she's able to um, uh, have a successful pregnancy following that. The one success story I can tell you is the one patient that came with excessive male hormone and she had a, a beard, a mustache, and this was because there was a tumor um, in her adrenal gland that was producing uh, the male hormone. So we were able to correct that, find the tumor, remove it. As soon as the uh, levels of androgens went down, she was able to fall pregnant uh, spontaneously on her own. So it's always important to investigate and find the cause because it can be as simple as correcting that cause and then the patient can um, uh, successfully fall pregnant on their own without assisted reproductive. Technologies. Well, that's an amazing story, Doc, because most friends, and I have a lot of friends, many of them do have a polycystic ovarian syndrome, a lot of them have endometriosis as well, and think there's no hope, I'm never going to have a baby, but it's, it's uh, and somebody who was as far gone as that for that stage must have been, it, it, it was quite a serious case as well, so I think you've given a lot of hope to a lot of people out there, but um, I, I just want to find out from you, like you said, the definition is you've had unprotected sex for a year, you still haven't been able to fall pregnant, does a couple come to you then, or can they come? Uh, at the point where they decide, now we want to start trying for a baby. Would you advise, if you are a young couple, you decided you want to start a family, come to us first, have all your checks done, um, and, and then let's see if there is anything that's pre-existing. Would that be advisable, or would that just be a waste of time? Wait for a year and see that you haven't been able to conceive in that time. So uh, uh, by definition, they have to wait a year. But obviously, um, what we say is that if there is a cause for the infertility, then they should not wait. They must go immediately. Or if they are older than 35, then they can only try for about six months. After that, they must uh, consult. Because what we're trying to do is reduce the time to pregnancy. So we don't want people to be delayed because they're thinking they want to wait a year. So what we have done, I'm in Cape Town now, the National Department of Health has guidelines for infertility, mm -hmm. and we've sort of specified what can be done at a primary health care level. So they can uh, go to the clinic and go to the nurses, and they should be able to evaluate whether they are menstruating, they are ovulating. They should be able to evaluate whether they are having um, um, adequate intercourse, which is important, and then advise them on the lifestyle uh, modification, like stop smoking and alcohol and so forth, to improve the fertility. So remember, we don't want to wait until people are infertile. Mm. We actually want to prevent uh, infertility because then we do not have to intervene and let them you know, pay high costs for infertility. Mm. So to, to go and be assessed early so that you can be told the things that you should avoid, mm. safe sexual practices, you know, to avoid sexually intra, um, uh, transmitted infection because that will cause uh, tubes to block. Yeah. So this is important that they must at every, we are saying that at every consultation with a healthcare provider, we must be able to assess what their fertility wish are and advise them accordingly. Mm. Because if we wait until they are infertile, then there's a problem. Then we have to really now treat the infertility. So there's guidelines about what can be done by a general practitioner, by a nurse, mm -hmm. and then by the gynecologist and so forth. So we don't want to restrict the, the treatment to higher centers where they go to a fertility specialist like myself. 
uh, they would rather start at the beginning and see what can be done at those levels. Well, you know, Doc, the, the, the common perception out there is that this process from diagnosis to having some kind of medical intervention, some kind of treatment, is very, very costly. And I think most of the time it is. Are there efforts to make it cheaper for couples who can't, to, uh, at the first go, have a baby to try and try and try again? So, of course, that is always the barrier to accessing the treatment mm. because it is so expensive. And it's very disheartening when we see people from low-income groups yes. and they're unable to access the service, whereas and then it looks like only people with money mm -hmm. can have access to the service. So this is why now it has become policy. It's, um, it's within the SRHR policy of the government. And we hope that with the National Insurance um, Fund that we will be able to increase the access and make sure that there the is highest quality care that is offered by all our health care providers. All right, Dr. Nene, thank you so much for that in-depth explanations as well and giving hope to, to many people out there who might think they're at the end of the road uh, and have no hope of having a baby. Still to come, we'll be talking about the impact of infertility on couples and families. We have with us Jerry and Karabo Zwane. They run an NPO called Hannah, You're Not Alone. We'll talk about what they went through and how they're using that experience to help others as well.